This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the School of Advanced Study um, and today's event, which is hosted by the Human Rights Consortium's Extreme Energy Initiative. And it's sort of doubling up as well as a, as a launch of our website, which um, I'm not going to interrupt Marianne's nice presentation. I'll show you at the end, for those of you who have not uh, visited it yet, but the, the address is extremeenergy.org. And it's an initiative that we set up principally because as an academic institution that's interested in facilitating and promoting research on human rights issues, we're interested in looking at the human rights implications and environmental implications of extreme energy processes. So today's uh, talk by uh, Dr. Mariam uh, Lloyd-Smith will be looking at um, some of these issues in the Australian context. And, um, Marianne is someone who's worked for the, um, to get this, this title right, the um, National Toxics Network, is that correct? Yes, yes the senior advisor. Okay, and um, the topic that she'll be looking at today uh, is a very strong interest to me as someone who's worked on the Australian issues in the past, but principally looking at uh, things like Indigenous rights. I'm interested to hear about the, the wider implications of these issues in the Australian context. So without further ado, then I'll hand over to uh, Marianne. Thank you. And I'll try to make this as informal because we're a little group, so uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, everything I talk about is actually in our brief, and if you could read that, which is a little hard, I'm not sure why, it's just simply ntn.org.au, and you can download the brief from the first page. Um, the talk I'm going to give, basically, will sort of be divided into three areas. Um, some of the concerns and the, you know, the issues around unconventional gas. Then I'm going to look at some of the evidence that we're seeing in Australia of actual impacts that are happening and are measurable. And then I'd like to end with some positive stuff about what Australian communities are doing. But I thought I'd just start off with the, just to remind us that um, the United Nations Human Rights Council basically said living in a pollution-free world is a basic human right. And those that pollute violate those human rights. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, our right to life, both ours and our children's, are threatened by everything from toxic chemicals, hazardous waste, contaminated drinking water. Um, similar areas in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the right to eat your uh, traditional foods and the <coughs> foods to be uncontaminated. And in the Convention on the Rights of a Child, you have the right to health, food and clean water. And I would suggest that unconventional gas activ activities threaten those human rights. I want to put the little African kids there because it's important to remember this isn't something that's just happening in Australia or UK or Canada or the US. It's happening in Indonesia, in India, in China, in the uh, Brazil. Um, unfortunately, the Amazon has one of the biggest uh, areas of untapped um, unconventional gas. So make sure we know all what we're talking about. What is unconventional gas and what is fracking? Well, the two main sorts are shale and coal seam gas, or what you call coal bed methane. So if you hear me refer to CSG, that's what I'm talking about. And there are also things like type gas, which is uh, methane found in limestone or sandstone. Um, but I'll just focus on these two mostly, and these are the two that I think uh, the UK has most of. Um, shale gas is shale found deep into the ground. It's much deeper than coal bed methane. Um, it always needs to be hydraulically fracked to release the gas, and it uses considerable amounts of water, up to 38 megalitres, to do each hydraulic fracture. Where, as coal seam gas, it's much shallower. Um, it needs to be depressurised, that is, you need to get the water out of the seam before the gas flows. But as the pressure declines, then it is quite often then hydraulic fracturing is used. <coughs> so in Australia, about 40 to 60 percent of all coal bed methane wells are hydraulically fractured and it uses a little less water, but then it produces an awful lot more um, produced water, which I have learnt in uh, England is not called produced water, not called wastewater, it's called returned water, because that sounds so much nicer. <laughs> so that's just a very sort of, you know, uh, simplified issue of a horizontal frack. Um, 
Just one thing, you'll often hear industry say, but we've been fracking for 50 years. And I tried to think of a comparison. Um, what they did 50 years ago was like paddling a canoe, and what they do now is more like a nuclear submarine. So, you know, that's the comparison. It, it's not. What is happening now is not what was happening 50 years ago. So what are our shared environmental concerns? And I'll explain why I say shared now. They focus on water, not only water contamination, but water equity, the drawdown of the water table, particularly worrying with coal bed methane, where some of our farmers have had their water table drawn down anything up to 60 to 100 metres, which basically means if you're a farmer, you lose access to your water. Then, of course, the ones most people talk about, the contamination of surface water and bore water. The whole idea of chemicals, the identity, the quantities, the mixtures, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Big sleeper, the air pollution issue. I was quite stunned when we met with some of the UK MPs a couple of weeks ago who looked at us blankly when I talked about air pollution, and they said that we didn't know there was any issues to do with air pollution, which I was a bit surprised. <coughs> and then, of course, there's the issues of wastes. And if you haven't seen that image there, um, it's pretty much everywhere at the moment. That is the Tara gas fields, which is in southeast Queensland. Um, a colleague of mine has a property smack bang in the middle of that. That, I think, is about 50 or 60 wells, so you can imagine what 4,000 wells looks like. So I talked about shared environmental concerns. It's not just NGOs or academics or uh, the local uninformed community. The United Nations Environment Program last year put out a global environmental alert in about October last year. And it basically said that unconventional gas exploitation and production may have unavoidable environmental impacts. Some will occur if you use the technology incorrectly, but others will occur if you use the technology correctly. And what they basically are saying is that you cannot regulate this industry into a safe, no-risk situation. It just is impossible. Their shared environmental concerns are about greenhouse gas emissions, water contamination, water resources, pretty much all the same ones as we have. And the image there is a colleague of mine who has a property, a 2,000 acre, uh, sorry, 2,000 hectare um, cattle property in Queensland. That is the sump from his bore. He had a very good bore, produced huge amounts of water, the industry started to practice in his area. He lost access to that bore. It just literally collapsed. They drilled him a new bore. Um, and as you can see, there's an awful lot of methane coming out of that bore. So we don't light our taps in Australia. We light our bores. Some people have never seen what a drill platform looks like. That's a coal bed methane platform from Queensland. And it's very, very typical of what a drill site will look like when the drilling's under, you know, undergoing. Um, and of course it has a flare and it has a turkey's nest to store the polluted water. Um, but it gives you a good idea. I couldn't get a shale gas one from Australia, mainly because in Australia we've got coal bed methane down the east coast, shale down the west coast, and that's a quite a few hours, you know, plane right away, so I wasn't popping over there. So I've used the Marcellus one, but as you can see, it's very, very similar to the coal bed methane one. Okay. So now we get on to the chemicals, which is what I work in, so this is my real interest. Um, lots of focus on hydraulic fracturing fluid, very little focus on drilling fluids. Drilling fluids are made up with some very serious chemicals like corrosion inhibitants, lubricants and weighting agents. Now these are the same drilling fluids as you would use for big ordinary conventional gas, but the point is in big ordinary conventional gas you drill one or two wells. In coal bed methane shale gas you drill thousands of them, so it's just an issue of quantity. But if we focus on the fracking fluids, you'll often hear Fracking fluids, what goes down into the well to, to, you know, break it open. I didn't actually give you a description well enough at the beginning. But it's basically into the well goes the water, the chemicals, the sand and the propants. 
um, and with that volume and the pressure, you fracture the rock, which allows the gas to escape. Well, you'll often hear that it's very, very dilute chemical amounts. Yes, it is, under 2%. But when you actually look at the industry's documents, and I spend an awful lot of time doing that, which is sort of weird, I should get a life, um, you'll find that that actually interprets into, or translates into 18,500 kilograms, or just over 18 tonnes of chemical additive for coal bed methane. Uh, for shale, they talk, the, the document I had talked between um, 8 and 16 tonnes of chemical additive and we know we're in the right ballpark because the EU report came out last year and talked about 16 tonnes of acute toxics for tight gas. That's so, per well. Per well, per well, per frack. So, you know, that's probably important to think about that. Um, yes, and feel if, I, if there's something I skim over that you just want to, you know, ask clarification, please do. The interesting thing is we were at an OECD meeting last November where we spoke with probably 60 or 70 regulators from the developed countries. Um, all of them told the same story. The chemicals used have not been assessed in their industrial chemical processes. In my country, of the 23 most commonly used um, fracking chemical, only two had ever gone through any form of assessment process, but not for their use in hydraulic fracturing. Much of what is used is still claimed as trade secrets. You'll get what's called a manufacturer safety data sheet for the product, but on that you will only have maybe 10, 20, sometimes a bit more percent of that product listed in actual chemical name with a CAS number. So still today, much of what goes down into the ground in that 18 tonnes is not known. Many of the MSDSs, material safety data sheets, will have short-term, long-term health effects listed. They all have in common limited environmental fake data and so little, if any, ecotox data. So basically what that means is it goes into the ground with us not really knowing how that's going to impact on organisms under the ground, everything from bacteria um, to aquatic life. So what we're really dealing with is simply an unassessed mixture of chemicals that are made up of carcinogens, neurotoxins, sensitizers, and endocrine disruptors. And in 2011, the University of New York did a risk assessment on fracking fluids and concluded that a number of them were dangerous at concentrations near or below the chemical detection level. So basically, you know, they were having an impact below what we could actually measure. I mentioned earlier propens, and it's a term you'll often hear in relation to this industry. It's the little grains that go down with the fluid into the cracks and then hold the cracks open. Industry will often say to you, it's just sand. Yeah. Well, it is sand, it's silica. But it's also alumino silica ceramic polymers <coughs> based on nanotechnology now. There's a number of patents that you can look at those. Um, but even if it's just silica, last year um, OSHA and NIOSH, the occupational health people in the US, put out a silica fracking alert because of the number of fracking workers who were contracting silicosis, which is a lung disease um, and very, very nasty. I don't expect you read them. I just popped them up there. I put up the list of probably some of the most commonly used hydraulic fracturing chemicals, because I really get fed up with hearing that these are the chemicals that you would find under your sink, in the kitchen, in your bathroom cabinet. I can assure you, if I found those in your bathroom cabinet, I would be very, very disturbed. But as you can see, these are quite serious groups of chemicals. They are not soft. You know, we have respiratory toxins, we have endocrine disruptors, we have reproductive toxins. So, you know, they're a, they're a pretty nasty bunch. As well as what goes down is what's released from the ground. And so these are natural contaminants that are found within the coal seam or the shale seam that are released by the drilling and fracturing process. And it's everything from the BTEX, the benzene, type, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, through to the volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds, 
heavy metals, the naturally occurring radioactive substances like um, uranium and radium, and of course radon. Um, and although radon is a problem in people's cellars in the States, there is no safe level of exposure to radon. That comes straight from the WHO and the US EPA. And flaring, which is a big issue. Wherever you're going to have a gas field, you will have flares, you know, numerous ones, and that's what a flare looks like, pleasant looking thing. Um, and they produce, again, a range of air pollutants. The US EPA has banned um, flaring after 2015. That won't happen in Australia, and I, from what my discussions with the UK people, it doesn't look like that's going to be replicated here. But it gives you an idea of how serious it is. And if it's coal bed methane, you have a problem with salts. On the most conservative figures um, in Australia, we have five tonnes of salt every 10 days. So five tonnes per megalitre, megalitre every 10 days. So that's the most conservative. Again, these are wastes. What do you do with them? The industry has often said to them, but I'll sell them back into the chemical industry. And you talk to my colleagues in the chemical industry and they say, why on earth would we want this contaminated salt? We can't use it. It would cost us so much to clean it. So unfortunately it is a waste and at the moment it's just going into landfill. So okay, the, the chemical issues, but to have uh, an impact from a chemical or a compound, you need some exposure pathway or practices. Mm -hmm. And I'd suggest that the industry has a number of practices that allows us to be, us and the environment and our animals to be exposed. Um, the image there is one of the ways we deal with produced or wastewater in Australia, and I can see a few groans of faces. That's called dust suppression. You see, when you've got a very dusty road, you just spray your produced water down the road. That keeps the dust down until it dries out, and then the dust is even worse than it was before because it's now contaminated. But that's not the only thing we do with it. But um, produce water, it has all those things, and heavy metals, norms, and BTEX and Vox. You can put in ponds. I've been told here in the UK you will not have holding ponds. We used to have evaporation ponds, but we made those illegal, so we now call them holding ponds, so everyone feels so much better about it. But in the UK, you won't have holding ponds. So I say to the regulators, well, what are you going to do with this? How much is it? 0.8 megalitres a day for coal bed methane. It can go up to 4,500 litres for shale. What are you going to do? And they said, we will truck it away. OK, you're going to truck it away. <laughs> Where are you going to truck it? Oh, to a waste facility, which will manage it, which I'll get on into in a sec. But even if that was possible, Envisage the number of trucks you would need to carry that amount of wastewater per day. But, okay, say you can take it to a waste facility. We use the most common waste treatment for this water is called reverse osmosis. It's quite high tech, it's very expensive, and it is very energy hungry. But when you actually speak to the guys who run the processes, who do it, they say they cannot take out the small molecular weight chemicals. So they can't take out methanol and ethylene glycol and a range of those vox. It's just impossible. The, the, in, the technology just does not deal with it. So basically you have partially treated water. That's not treated at all. But you have partially treated water, which you've then got to deal with. Um, in America, they re-injected it back into the aquifer. In Australia, they say that's too expensive and too difficult and they can't, so they release it into waterways, and I'll show you a bit of that in a sec. Probably the most, I think, um, I can't think of a word to describe it, the thing that horrifies me more than anything else is in western Queensland where farmers have lost access to water because their water table has gone down. The companies then take this produced water back, partially treated, and offer it back to the farmers. And the farmers are so desperate for water, they accept it. They also accept a contract which says there is no agreement for quality or quantity, and if there are any contamination issues in the future, you, the farmer, will take that on. I, the company, can now walk away free from that contamination issue, which I personally think is immoral to say the least. When you come to hydraulic fracturing, of course, there's ways, there's pathways. You have unintentional fractures, 
which can you know lead to aquifer mixing you have blowouts leaks spills and of course the flow back issue which is what comes back out once you've pumped everything down and then you have the problem with landfill we do as does new zealand and america do a lot of land spraying of drilling months again i've been told by the regulators here that will never happen so i say to them what are you doing with your drilling months you're going to drill thousands of wells what are you going to do with this massive tonnage oh we'll send it to a landfill so you know you've got these massive problems and i can assure you paying for the cost of sending all your drilling months to landfill very very quickly the companies will be saying well, I think we could find a reuse for that, and uh, agricultural land sounds a good place to spray it. Um, there's also the problems of venting gases. So these are all pathways which allow people and humans and the environment to be exposed. Um, anyway. I just popped that up there because this is a permit for treated waste water. So I stress that this is not water that hasn't been treated. This has gone through a reverse osmosis. It's an old permit. It finished halfway through last year, so it's all done and gone. Um, the release relates. There, uh, there were 60 chemicals they gave release rates for. They're all legal. You know, it's not illegal. But why I put it up there is I think it's important to see what the accumulative load. Um, Yes, some of these will get washed downstream and end up in somebody's backyard or drinking water. Many of them are um, very persistent. They will drop to sediment and they'll sit in the sediment. But as you can see, you end up with many tons of chemical going into a waterway. This is going into Condamine River, which is the drinking water source for many, many communities um, in uh, Queensland. But they're, they're, I think they're quite considerable, considerable figures. Okay, so that was all the, the concerns and the issues. This is some of the measurable evidential impacts that we're seeing. The photo there is what the industry will tell you will never happen. That's called a blowout. It happened in Western Sydney. It went on for about four hours. There was no way they could stop the pressure. It just kept blowing. And so that's basically surfactants and various chemicals that are coming out with the water. Um, I'll just start off with the US EPA one, and what I would do is that nobody else has done this sort of assessment. Um, in 2011, the EPA, and this study wasn't actually released until the end of last year because there was so much opposition from the industry about it being released, but they went and investigated 23 drinking water wells in Pavilion, Wyoming, basically because there'd been complaints about smell, about taste, um, and you know the EPA couldn't ignore it anymore. And after that, they tested for a huge number of chemicals, and sure enough, they found quite a range of compounds associated with hydraulic fracturing in the aquifers at or below the depths where there was domestic water being drawn from. So it was a clear indication, once and for all, that um, hydraulic fracturing fluids could end up in aquifer. A lot of criticism of this report, as there always is on any report that shows evidence, industry say that it is unrepresentative because the um, where they hydraulically fracked was much lower than where you would normally find shale. But the response to that is they found shale at this lower level, they fracked at this lower level, and you know this is real world, and this is what happened. In my own country, in Queensland, Arrow Energy had to acknowledge um, late in 2011 that BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene and xylene, were being picked up in the water bores, they're monitoring water bores that they dig around the gas fields. Benzene was 6 to 15 times the Australian drinking water standard, so we consider those reasonably high levels. Um, much, I, I've got to say, much, much um, lower than the level that the Scottish Government is going to allow Dart Energy to release its benzene, which I was quite shocked at those. I just saw them yesterday. Um, I was involved in some work with another colleague where we tested a wellhead uh, 24 hours after it was fracked. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in the water, we got a range of volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds, as well as benzene, as well as heavy metals, basically giving you the evidence that that is coming up with the produced water and the flow back. And then the colleagues, well, who I showed you earlier where it was burning, uh, the industry went in and tested that because 
there was a big debate about whether there was methane or not, and sure enough, they found toluene and methane in his drinking water. <coughs> and of course, there's the famous methane in the US drinking water wells whoops, study. Sorry, I'm not a PC person, so I'm just... Um, in that one, uh, that study basically was published by the U.S. National Academy of Science, showed that if you lived within a kilometre of a gas well, you had a much greater risk of having methane in your water, up to 60 times. Similar story with impacts on air. Um, again, I just start off with that U.S. study. That was a shale study. And whilst it was a 12-month study, it's the only study I've seen where you actually sampled air over a long period of time. And what it really showed was not only did you pick up a range of quite nasty air toxins, um, but the highest levels weren't during fracking, they were during drilling, which I think everyone was quite surprised about. And also, it was also showed how important it is to do it over a long period of time because you got differences in the levels over that. So when a company goes in and tests an air sample once and says, well, we didn't find anything, we can now walk away, um, this study just clearly shows how silly that is. But last year, oh, sorry, this year, um, in my, again, in my own area, in Queensland, Tara Gas Fields, the Southern Cross University, who's our local university, released their study, which showed clearly there was a threefold increase on radon, methane, and carbon dioxide within the gas field, within the Tara gas field, compared to outside the gas field. Industry's response was, well, of course, because that's why we're there getting the gas. But what they failed to mention was that there was a significant correlation, significant relationship with the proximity of wells and the number of wells. So the closer you were to the wells, the more wells there were, the higher the level of radon, carbon dioxide and methane. Industry hates this study because it's the first study that is clearly showing methane is coming up not only through leaking of wells, not only through the venting, but we're seeing a, a movement of gases through the soil. And we believe that to be because of the hydraulic fracturing has started to fracture and allow the gases to escape through the soil. It basically means that the idea then of you know, carbon capture, of somehow capturing yes, this, is impossible because this, is, this was done over a wide area where they just basically drove the truck through with the testing equipment. It was real world equipment. The residents who live around the Tara gas fields um, have had a lot of health symptoms, and I'm going to touch on those in a second. But what happened is we went in and did some air monitoring, industry went in and did some air monitoring, and the Queensland Government went in and did some air monitoring. And lo and behold, we all found the same things. So again, these are a range of volatile organic compounds. Some of them are carcinogens, some of them are neurotoxins, but they are very serious things to have in your air around your home. Um, again, we've had uh, attempts to criticise and say, oh, this may have come from their lifestyle. But when it was across, I think, 16, yeah, 16 homes, yeah, that seemed a little bit you know, unbelievable. And anyway, some of the samples were taken well out into the paddock, so it, it was of concern. I was also involved in some studies where we did eight-hour sampling next door to wells and came back with chlorofluorocarbons. Um, there's not many of us here with grey hair, but it's grey hair, but some of us would remember the big fight to get rid of ozone depleters, free, free on one, 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 three. These are the two we found. We don't believe the industry is illegally using them. We believe that they are being formed as byproducts mm -hmm. of the products that are going into the soil, um, into the well. And of course, the Queensland uh, uh, government did a well health safety program, and of I think 400 wells, 120 were leaking methane. The image there, and I've got a better one in a second, is methane bubbling in that same Condamine River, that tragic river I just told you about. This started about six months ago. Um, the industry had been there for a couple of years by then, but some fracking occurred within a kilometre or so of the river, and it appears that fractures have occurred underneath the river. And here's a better one of it. Um, and as you can see, it's just bubbling. It's bubbling for kilometres. Sometimes, you know, anything up to 10, 12 kilometres. Um, again, 
government industry have said, oh, but this is natural. Well, the farmers who have farmed it all their lives, their parents, they've never seen it before. Um, and it, it's all been measured. It is quite significant levels of methane, but when told we shouldn't be worried. Okay. I'm going to do two more depressing ones and then get on to some <laughs> positive, happy ones. Nobody really talks and thinks about the real health impacts of this industry. And I think the first time when that was really highlight, highlighted is when Mackenzie in 2012 did this risk assessment. And it was for shale air emissions, it was a US one. And they basically came back and said, well, if you lived within a half a mile of a um, well, a shale gas well, you had a higher risk for respiratory and neurological problems and a greater excess cancer lifetime risk if you lived there your whole life. That, that study has actually been backed up with some new work that's now come out of Canada, which is um, I haven't actually got here, but is worth having a look at. But if you come closer to home for us, this poor community I keep coming back to, the Tara community, of the 38 households, 60% have got health symptoms. And, you know, when, when I say skin and eye rashes and severe headaches, you know, you think, oh gosh, they're not very serious, but the paresthesia, the tingling, the numbness, the burning, the pins and needles, um, these are debilitating symptoms. They're not, they're not, you know, oh, I've got a headache today. These are debilitating to the point where, you know, people can't function anymore. Finally, we forced the Queensland government to go in and do a health report, and, you know, based on all the limited stuff they did, and it was a very minimal report, they came back with the statement that some, some evidence, there was some evidence that might associate the resident's symptoms to exposure to airborne CSG contaminants. A very, you know, minimal response, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit why that was the case in a second. Um, in Chinchilla, we had a group of farmers who uh, were experiencing breathing difficulties, headaches, noxious odours. The company came in, um, offered them an air conditioner and a confidentiality agreement. And in true Australian style, they told them what they could do with both, which is not repeatable in any manner or form. But it was just, it, to some degree, it was an acceptance of liability, but I don't think it would stand up in court as an acceptance of liability. I popped the Pennsylvania um, surveys up there because I just want to show you how consistent they are with the Tara, which I'm going to come back to in a sec. Um, very, very similar sorts of symptoms. And it's important to remember it's not only affecting humans. Um, there's a very interesting report, the Bamberger report, which talks about how it's affecting animals as well. And I think they've looked at six states where we have issues to do with animal deaths, spontaneous abortions, um, various health effects for animals who are exposed to produce water on the basis. That's my granddaughter up there, thought she was beautiful. Um, I just wanted to say that in the Queensland Health Report, there was no consideration of the children. There was no acknowledgement that children are not little adults, as the WHO have accepted now, that they have totally special vulnerabilities to health impacts that adults don't, and that exposure at critical terms at times in their development can have lifelong impacts. Um, the Queensland Health Report also was based on some very inconsistent health data. One of the reasons we focus on it is because when it was released, sure enough, the industry said clean bill of health for CSG, and that was the headlines all over the papers. It wasn't what the report said, and it didn't look at things like the reporting limit for many of the chemicals they tested for was much, much, in some cases, 30 times higher than the health criteria. So you test for parts per billion when your health criteria is in parts per trillion, or you test for parts per million when your health criteria is in parts per billion. So it was a very deceitful process. There was no assessment of aggregate exposure for the kids, and of all of those families, only 15 were seen by an actual government-appointed doctor, who unfortunately was a, um, a consultant for the coal industry. When that happened, the local doctor that treats them was incensed. She had worked so hard to get some investigation, and so she's now undertaken her own study, which has now been published, and her concern is for the children. We have 17 children on that estate under the age of five, 
they all have a range of symptoms, but this last lot, the parasitia, are the ones that are of most concern because they're neurological symptoms, they are symptoms that are extreme, kids waking up in the middle of the night sort of crying out for mum saying, I've got ants in my pants. And when you try to get what that expression, what are they trying to say? They are saying, you know, that they're being stinging, they're being bitten. It's, it's, and as you can imagine, these sort of symptoms for parents are just terrible. Um, I just put up, uh, there's lots more in the report, some of the graphs that just show that before the industry, the kids from 6 to 18, none of them had constant headaches, severe headaches, after the industry about 13% had done. Okay, all right. So that was the end of the really <laughs> depressing news. Now this is the good bit, what Australia is doing about it. And this is a march that happened in my local town, Lismore. It's a town of around 35, 37,000 people and over 8,000 people turned out to march. Um, it was all focused around the lock the gate, lock the road, protect your community. The Lock the Gate Coalition, which I'll explain in a second, is the fastest growing social movement in Australia. And it has some of the strangest bedfellows. We have, you know, everyone from farmers through to um, NGOs and environment groups, through to fishers and the Country Women's Association and health professionals. And even, I'm not sure what, if the word is something you understand, but shock jocks. Shock jocks, you know, yeah, right, so people understand what shock jocks are. And they have one clear message, and that is, you as an industry may have all your legal pollution licences, you may have your permits, you may have your production licences, but what you don't have is a social licence. You have no social licence from this community, and we have no intention to give you one. The Lock the Gate Coalition, and I just say in the meetings we've been having recently in, in some of the villages around the UK, we've now got communities who are setting up in a Lock the Gate process, which is fantastic. And it's basically based on the idea that there's a precedent that said, okay, you as a company may have the right to come in, force me into arbitration, force me into the environment court because I don't own the minerals under the ground. The government owns them and the government has given you a permit. So you may have that right, but what you don't have the right to do is enter a gate that is locked and signposted. And so we have a legal precedent. Now we haven't tested this in court yet, but it sounds good and it's working. It's an incredibly powerful strategy because it's a form of resistance it makes it costly, difficult, and time-consuming for the industry. And due to it, we've had licenses surrendered, we've had moratoriums. We now have in my state, in New South Wales, a two-kilometre exclusion zone. That is, you cannot drill a well or frack a well within two kilometres of a residential area, which is defined as more than a 1,000 people, or agricultural infrastructure, such as, and these are the examples they give, a vineyard, a winery, or a horse breeding area, which I'd suggest is what Australians hold dear, booze and horses. <laughs> so, anyway, this lock the gate strategy has now moved into a gas field free community strategy. And the idea is, is that if one single landowner locks his gate, well then the company can take that landowner to court they can force them into arbitration. But if his next door neighbour locks the gate and his next door neighbour locks the gate and 10 landowners lock the gate, for the company it's a case of a rapidly diminishing return. You have to take every one of them to court. And it's working. So this is one of the first communities declaring their um, CSG community uh, strategy. This was before they actually did the full process and there is a process and it's very important to go through this process because the process builds community which is what you need to fight. And so basically there's a seed meeting with a group of people, then they promote a public meeting, they get to know their suburb or their village or their road, they define how big they want to go, they then hold a public meeting they then have a kit and a survey, and all of this is available. People 
volunteer to take the survey and go and knock on every door. There's nothing, you know, you don't pop it in a letterbox and hope someone reply. You talk to your neighbour. And when you talk to your neighbour, they're provided with a CD. So they get a bit of information as well. And so you start the dialogue. After that, you gather in those surveys. Then, if you have enough numbers, you make a declaration. And that declaration says, my street, my village, my town is CSG free. That gives you an idea of some of the towns that have already been done and you can see the percentages down there that said no, we don't want it here, we want to see us G free. I think the smallest was 95.5. When a full um, proper uh, referendum was done at the local council elections of this area, it was 87.7 that said no. And as you can see, to just illustrate, the Shannon was where it started. Terrania Creek was where it went on, and so each of these communities, you can see what happens. It just basically turns the region into pretty much a no-go region for the company. Has no legal status whatsoever. I do stress that. This is a moral statement, but the companies aren't crossing those lines. But you can imagine the PR if they did. Okay, so for many people, that's where they stop. For others, oh yeah, we put up our signs and our banners and then you have the ceremony and then you present the woman in red as our mayor collecting all the declarations of the CSG free communities, building that, you know, consolidation of communities. And then this was at one of the marches where everyone who's done their roads goes and pops up their signs. So, as I said, for some people that's where it stops and that's fine, but for others, Stage two is to prepare for nonviolent direct action. And this image here are a group of young people. There was a very large holding dam being built in their region. It was an eight hectare holding dam for polluted water. And so every day the tractors were out there digging the big holding dam. And every night the kids were out there with their spades filling it back in. Now, it, it was a lesson in futility. No one ever thought we were ever going to win. But it was, again, it was a delay tactic. It was a tactic, again, to say to the industry, you're not welcome. Mm. But it's, you know, the actions are always nonviolent. There is no, no other action will be accepted. But what's important is that they are totally non-negotiable. And just a few more. This is a farming community down at Glenugie, um, a very conservative farming community. They look like good Australian ones, though, as you can see in our T-shirts and shirts. But they called for help when um, the company wanted to come into their community. And so this is another side of direct action. These are the knitting nanas against gas. And don't you love them turning up to their blockade on their walking frames <laughs> with their knitting and their signs? And you think, oh, what lovely women, you know, gentle souls. This is them at work. They're up a tripod, knitting the web of life. As you can see, it's a tripod in the distance. The police are there. The girl's on the side here holding the sign. She's one of the super girls against gas, dressed in her beautiful super girl outfit. You know, I know these all seem very trivial, but the blockades have to be peaceful. They have to be something that people want to do and something that people gain um, strengths from. So there they are getting our knitting nana against gas down using the uh, cherry picker. Just to end on this, the indigenous people are working side by side. They don't want this to happen in their land and it really has been a wonderful thing to bring indigenous peoples and green NGOs who sometimes don't see eye to eye but bring them together. And so on that, I will finish, leaving you with a lovely image of a gas field. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> okay, any questions? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, starting with that. Yeah. Now, what people say here is, ah, oh, well, that's not going to happen here. Mm. We'll have these pads and you'll have... 12 miles off each pad, radiating out. 
Yes, yes. Uh, um, what do you say to that? Okay. Even if you have a pad with 12 wells mm -hmm. rating out, um, the wells last about 7 yeah. to 15 years. Not for about a year. But, uh, the gas, yeah. well, the gas actually <coughs> has 50 to 75% of the gas is gone within that first 12 months. Mm -hmm. So everything after that is just dragging out the last bit. Mm -hmm. So even if you do numerous wells in one pad, mm -hmm. To continue the gas field, mm -hmm. you've then got to move to the Another next one, and you've got to move to but the next one. It would look rather less intense than that. It would look. They're all. They are horizontal wells, mm -hmm. but they're not no, they're what single, wells. single or double maybe. Mm -hmm. But what they're talking about here is doing the numerous radi you know, radiating mm -hmm. out, and then having them come down. I still think you would have to have wells in the thousands mm -hmm. to provide the gas that the companies are telling their, you know, mm. uh, investors mm. that they're going to make. Mm. I think there's been some estimates of, you know, in, in Scotland alone they would need something like 20,000 wells to bring out the gas that they're being told they're going to be able to produce. 20,000 pads or 20,000 wells? 20,000 wells, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Mm. But it, it may not look exactly like that, but that's... You know, when you still talk about that photo I show you at the beginning. Mm. Sorry, I just dash back. Oh, oh, doesn't oh, matter, oh. doesn't matter. <laughs> but they say the, the of that, they say the. Um, where was that? Yes, I mean, I mean, what, what I'm told when I say, you know, the figure, tell yep. these that's back wrong, or whatever the figure is. Uh, current practice is, current good practice is. It's the pad. But do you get those in Australia or not? In Australia, we have multiple wells off each pad, but not as many as I'm hearing here. Yeah. Yeah. And in Australia, you would normally have, you could have one horizontal and then a second horizontal, yeah. or one horizontal going that way and a second horizontal mm. going that way. But not what I'm hearing here. Mm. But then, if you're going to do that, the other argument about that is if you're going to have this massive sort of Christmas tree under the ground, the impact of your fracking, yeah, the yeah. impact of your soil yeah. disturbance is going to be so much greater than the horizontal wells that we have. Yeah. Also, may I add, I went to something where they were talking about the fracking with the UK specific, um, and the, the current technology they have is not for highly populated areas, densely populated, they haven't made no. something so far densely populated areas in the UK. It's all in rural places in America and Australia. Yeah. In Australia, um, Dart Energy, uh, which is the company that's here in the UK now from Australia, thank you, we are very pleased you've got them and we don't. They've left Australia now. Mm -hmm. claim, oh yes, yes, they've pulled out of Australia, claiming that our regulations are inappropriate and unacceptable and they can't function within our regulations because they're so you know severe so they're here in Australia and then the UK MPs say to me oh but we're going to have so much stronger regulations we will never that'll never happen in the UK because we've got stronger regulations and you say well darts just left Australia because our regulations are so strong but they've set up here so that you know that argument doesn't hold water um, yes it is <laughs> But Dart Energy, one of their first proposals was to frack smack bang in the middle of Sydney in some of the densest areas, um, which was wonderful. I couldn't have thanked them more because, as you can imagine, they brought out 10,000 people onto the street in the first week. So, but you're absolutely right. that Those technologies, and the more I hear about this multiple Christmas tree layered well that they're talking about here, would be totally inappropriate to areas where you've got high density people. It would be just, yeah, ridiculous. Yes? Yeah, I mean, is there any precedent for um, what they're claiming they can do? Because it strikes me that actually what they've seen is kind of a potential backlash in Balcombe, the home counties, um, due to the kind of industrialisation of the countryside. So they've gone, oh, oh shit, like how can we kind of get around that? And they're kind of claiming now at this kind of really sensitive stage for the shale gas industry in the UK mm -hmm. that, oh, the, the, the impact's going to be nothing like, say, the photo that you put up there because we can put, like, I don't know, six to eight wells on each pad, but they've got no precedent for that. And so there's nothing holding them to actually doing that in the future. That's not the, the, the no. There is a precedent in America, uh -huh. but the wells tend to be trending along one axis. 
Because if they fan out, you mm. sterilise a lot of the land in the circle. So you have to trend them in a straight line and then put them side by side. So I don't understand that. Uh, um, if you have a circle fanning out in a circle, yeah. at the edges of that circle, when you put it up against the other circles, yes. you have a lot of sterilised land, land which will be inaccessible. Of course. The process. So, but if you trend the wells in a straight line, side by side, let's so say... they're all getting the same picture the Yeah, pan, six one getting... way, six the other way. Yeah, yeah. And then you put them, sandwich them side by side across the field. Yeah. You, you're intensifying the amount of strata which are in contact with your wells. Yeah. and not sterilising the resource in the ground by having a circular pattern. So that, that's what they've been doing in parts of um, Alabama, in the coal seam gas fields in Alabama. But then you will have more... But then you will end up with lots of paths. Hmm? You, lots of you, you still end up with lots of paths. Yeah. And or very long ones. Often if you, if you refract the well and you get a well break, mm. you then have to develop a new pad because it disrupts the other wells as well. Because once you break the seal on one well, you disrupt the ones next to it. So you have to set up a whole new pad and redraw the whole pad. Sorry. Right. No, thank That's you. Saying. Thank you very much. I'm learning something. <coughs> Super. Yes, sorry. Hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, how is the Lock the Gate Coalition and the whole issue, in fact, presented in the local media, in the press, such as the Courier Mail, for instance? Um, it's very mixed and matched. Um, for example, the Sydney Morning Herald is very supportive of the Lock the Gate because they've been based in Sydney, they saw how that whole issue in Sydney developed. The Courier Mail um, is not what we would call a, a paper that is very friendly towards um, environmental issues. And so sometimes they can be quite derogatory, but it's interesting they are not as derogatory about lock the gate as they are about the Tara residents. Um, so, for example, in the Korean Mail, the Tara residents are referred to as blockies, which just means that they're poor rural residents. You know, they're, they're not comfortable uh, rural people. It's a very derogatory term. So, uh, there's certainly an attempt to play down the health issues not as great an attempt to play down the environment issues. Um, and that could be because the head of the Lock the Gate, um, or the guy that set it up, there is no Ed, Drew, um, Drew Hutton, is a Queenslander. Um, so he's well, reasonably well respected as a Queenslander. And he is um, a former student of one of the shock jocks. So one of the shock jocks taught him how to play tennis and a whole load of... So there's these incredible interpersonal relations which are pulling together this coalition that you would never expect. But it's, and it really shows the importance of face-to-face -face contact, building the relations with this whole thing. But no, no paper really wants to come out and blast to lock the gate too much because they've got a whole load of, you know, farmers and landowners and, and quite comfortable landowners who don't want this to happen to their property. So they're supporting Lock the Gate. And the, the one other... Sorry? The Country Women's Association. The Country... The, they'd never marched before in their life. The Country Women's Association <laughs> marched, which was amazing. But the other thing I just should say about the Lock the Gate, it's not like a um, an environmental organisation with a leader or anything. So... Um, some of our colleagues in western New South Wales who are wheat farmers and cotton farmers who find it a little bit difficult to be associated too much with a greener organisation, they use exactly the same yellow sign with the black writing, but they call CSG free farms. So it's like if you want to take the strategy and, and make it a little bit more appropriate for your community, that's fine but as long as you st stick to the process of building that community, that's what's important. Thank you. Paul? Um, you've talked about copper methane and shale gas. You haven't talked about underground gasification. <laughs> and you've got three sites which the whole underground gasification world is looking at in Queensland. Now, yeah. Kingroyne has shut and Cougar Energy have gone off to that's China. Right. That's uh, right. Because it represented an imminent threat to the environment. Chinchilla, you've got all these smells coming out of the ground. Now, we tried underground gasification in Britain in the 50s, 
And the site in Worcestershire had exactly that problem. The snow was just coming about the ground everywhere. Yep. And nobody's made that connection. But we've got 20 licenses which have been issued for underground gasification in Britain. There's one in the pipeline to be granted in the next month or two. Where's that? Underground gasification. When you where, set where, 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 where? Um, my map is on the internet. Um, but we'll talk about that later. But um, Clough Coal, uh, which is run by Ergy Clough, mm -hmm. is a very well connected Conservative Party, uh, long standing grandee. Um, they really want to get this going in Britain. And in Australia, as everywhere else we've tried this in yeah. the world, it's been bizarre. Now, the thing that I hoped you would talk about was perhaps about the. I can get very little data out of, out of the Queensland Environment Department. But there's the whole issue. We've, we've known for years about coal gasification and contaminated land around gas, gas works. And it's the same process. You're going to get polycyclic aromatic compounds, a load of all sorts of stuff coming out the ground. And it don't seem to be testing for that. The only thing I've seen so far yeah. is did the water spill from the plant or did the farmer spray it on their land? Yeah. Yes. And the, the fingerprint would say this isn't well water, this is processed water. So, uh, but. It's sort of like a black hole. I can't get anywhere with the, the, the gas, underground gasification in Queensland. Well, you and I and most other people that ever go near the Queensland government are about the same. Um, the oh, fact I that I should add, uh, um, yes. I, I just I saw the the Four Corners documentary at the beginning yes. of April. Yep. And would you like to talk about the scandal in the Queensland government about the, the dodgy health assessment? Sure, sure. Well, two two things. Um, Underground coal gasification, I, I personally think, even makes shale and coal seam gas look soft. It is an appalling process, and it is an appalling process because it just cannot be controlled, as you rightly point out. And the fact that um, we've had three trials in Australia, two have been closed down for pollution reasons and um, breaking of their environmental licences, and the fact that Lynx is still going, I'm, I'm a bit gobsmacked. I just cannot see how... Long, yeah, I agree. I don't think Link will survive. I think that will go as well. If those three are put down in Australia, the idea that it could be done in the UK is, you know, to use an expression, it's gobsmacking. I just can't believe that they would think that they could do it. Because I think the only other place we've had one is it Ukraine? Or? No, they, they tried it in Spain and it's they've got the long term one in Ukraine, which Ukraine. Is, was the original Soviet one, which has been That's no right. environmental monitoring. That's right, yes. Uh, and there's no baseline to compare it to, anyway. Yeah. Uh, there are the experiments in China and uh, Cougar Energy, who left uh, Kingaroy, they've gone off to China now. Yes. We are actually already talking with the Chinese NGOs because it's, you know, I, I despair of what's going to happen in China. It really is tragic. Um, when you said about the Four Corners program, the Four Corners is our national documentary. It happens once a week. It's an hour-long program. This is their second one on unconventional gas, which has just been fantastic. Um, what the, this second one was all about was the fact that the actual approvals for these projects, including underground gasification, were literally, you know, the, the regulator was given a 600-page document to assess and told that she was expected to get an answer back that afternoon. Um, so there was this massive push by a government who was going to get voted out, and this was, I think they saw it as a way of perhaps winning across a, a certain constituency, which in, in fact all it did was, you know, um, upset a certain constituency. So there's been a, a huge amount of um, debate about how much illegalities, or was it just political pressure to get these acceptances through. And, you know, when you then see what's happened, you can see it's exactly what we would expect. If you don't do any proper environmental assessment, um, you're in worse case than, you know, if you do. And, and, yeah, what has happened is atrocious. But that's about, you know, what you could say about that program was that it really showed up how bad the assessment process was in Australia. But since then, we've had a scientific committee set up um, and new regulations around water. And the scientific committee, the first big major project that it got um, offered to review, they just said, look, this wouldn't pass first year uni stuff, you know. Go away, come back when you actually have some proper data. And um, so far, we don't know what the company's going to do. But if we're lucky, maybe it'll be another one that'll leave Australia and 
come visit another country somewhere else. Not mentioning yourselves. Do you have a question here? Yes, I was just wondering, Marion, how long it takes from somebody having the idea that they want to have a lock the gate action in a particular community <coughs> through to getting it finished? And where does the idea come from? Okay, yeah. Um, there was, uh, I'll, I'll answer the first one first. The lock the gate came because Drew Hutton, who I said was the initiator of this, was out with some farmers in Western Queensland. And they said, you know, what, what on earth can we do? This industry is going to ruin us, you know. What can we do? And he's, the whole joke about, you know, shut the gate. We could shut the gate on this industry. We could stop them. And, you know, then there was the discussion, well, that didn't have any legal, you know, standing. And so from that debate, that discussion came the concept of lock the gate. That was at first just individual farmers locking the gate. Where that went was in the northern rivers of, of New South Wales, in our region, another woman called Annie Kia, who is a, a social scientist and a health professional, basically said, well, locking the gate one farmer, that's great, but let's see if we could lock a community. And so, you know, she sat down with a number of activists and worked the process out. And so now you can go to the CSG Free Northern Rivers website get a whole load of information about how you do the process. How fast, it's how fast can you organise a public meeting? How fast can you get people knocking on every door? The people in Balkan intend to do it in two weeks. They've started, they started last week. Um, and I, I think they will succeed. And so, you know, it's basically just how many, how big an area, are you looking at a suburb, are you looking at a road, are you looking at a whole town or a whole village? Um, so yeah, it's, it's just sort of varies, I suppose. Having you know, lived in that area in, in Australia and now seeing what's happening here, the only um, analysis I can make is that the Lockwood Gate had those yellow signs around for a while before the Lockwood Village. And so the presence and the understanding of resistance was visual, those mm -hmm. yellow, little yellow signs. Yeah. And that's the only difference I've seen here. I think there needs to be a little bit of pre-advertising. Mm -hmm. And now I think it'll be easier and people will feel more comfortable. They'll have a place to focus. Mm. But is that because of the type of information that's presented as you've given your presentation or is it some much broader concern that the community has? Because yeah, I think it is very depressing to look at all that detail. But yeah. So we have to find some way that the community will be energised to to move its campaign forward and do you know, achieve something. Yeah, I, I agree, it can be very depressing, and that's why I always make the comment, you know, please don't get depressed, just get through the first bit. <laughs> but we gave this exact same presentation in Balkan, and there was like 120 people. We were turning them away at the door, um, and they were eager for information. They did not, that's what I have noticed here. There aren't the sources of alternative information that, you know, we've had in Australia and we've had in, in the US. So people were eager for information, they were eager for information they felt they could rely on, and, and sometimes it's easier coming from outside the country, you know, to, so they were eager for that, but then once we took it from the information, okay, here's what you needed to know, now it's what you can do, then there was true excitement, there was real commitment. People were volunteering to, you know, to start knocking on doors. So. I do also understand it um, with with communities in in cities. Sometimes it doesn't; it's not as real to them. Whereas for a community in a village where they're looking out on a beautiful paddock and they can see the road, that the drill truck will come down, and they know the rig would never even fit between the you know the lovely edges. It's I think it is more real. Um, and then I say to people, even if you haven't got a response early. Don't panic because I can assure you the first time that drill rig comes down that road, you will have people. They will, they will just realise what's happening. And that's what we're seeing in, in Australia very much so. And, you know, I joke about our two kilometres about the fact that, you know, it's vineries and, and horse breeders. But one of the reasons that happened was because a company wanted to go into an area of New South Wales where all our beautiful vineyards were, where... There was all this tourism where, you know, beautiful horse studs, all of our race horses were bred. And these people would never protest normally. They would have never opposed anything. They were, 
you know, they were supporters of the government, but they saw the drill rig for the first time and went, that's not going to happen to my area. And so people do get mobilised very quickly when they do. And, and the one other thing on that, I would say, um, in a couple of the meetings, people have said to us, ah, but it's just nimbyism, which I find quite hysterical, you know, my backyard is a long way back there. And I say to people, but you just protect, you know, it's just nimbyism, you don't want it in your own backyard. And, you know, our response to that is, well, my backyard is the globe, I don't want it anywhere. I don't want to see this industry go off to India. I don't want to see it go off to the Amazon or China. And, and we will fight it here and we'll fight it in our own backyard and we'll fight it in China. Um, because it's not a case of nimbyism at all. It's a case of knowing what is good for this planet and what isn't, and this isn't good. It's a time. <laughs> Sorry. Can I ask about dissident shareholders? Uh, I mean, if, if you want to stop the industry, then are the uh, sh shareholders who are basically dissident going to ask questions that the, the company doesn't want to answer? Um, uh, is that movement? Yes, very, very good question. I should have brought that up. So thank you very much for raising that. One other part of our strategy is to hurt the industry where it hurts most money. So the, one of the things we did was look at all the investors. So in Australia, some of the biggest investors are pension funds, superannuation funds. So we approached them and said, you know, are you investing in this industry? And they said, well, we were thinking about it, or yes, we are, but we're getting so many complaints from the people who have their pension with us that we've decided we're not going to go down that path. And so slowly but surely, all of the superannuation companies are pulling out of the industry. Um, we've also had process where we've gone and spoken to some of the companies, like um, you know, gas companies, where people may have invested in a gas company and thinking, well, that's better, you know, better than coal, not knowing that their gas company also does shale or coal seam bed, um, coal bed methane. And so we've been talking to shareholders a lot. Um, I don't do that myself, but we have other people that do that. And that's working as well, but not as well as the pulling of the money, pulling of the investment. And when I heard, what was it, H, sorry, HSBC. Get the, HSBC. HSBC had invested such huge amounts of money in Data Energy, whose, you know, shares are at five cents, who have, I don't think a production, well, they may have a couple of production wells in Scotland. I was just stunned because if I was a, someone wanting a bank, I wouldn't be looking at a bank that would take such a risk with my money. I'd, I was just a bit stunned that what I thought was a really well-respected bank, I don't know, is this defamatory? I hope it's not. Um, what I thought was a really well-respected bank was investing in what I would call such a shady industry and such a, a company that when your shares are five cents, you know, you're really not talking about a company that's on solid ground. So, yeah. It's a very, very confidence image on global warming. Yes. It's a great one. But how many, you know, your Dara community? Atara, Atara yes. Atara community. And then we know about the one in Pennsylvania. Yes. Right? Canada. How many really strict communities are there? There's an awful lot of shell gas wrapping around. The industry makes the point, you know, it's most places there's no problem. Yes, they did make that point. Um, there's a particularly good document, which I could send you, um, which lists all of the harm, all of the cases of harm. And it goes on for pages after pages. So it's families who are living beside a well who have had death of animals or death of, you know, or sorry, the sickness of humans. Um, that's a particularly good one. There are hundreds in there. The Bamberger Report, which looks at animal health, looked at numerous states and, and just, uh, again, documents incident after incident after incident. The industry will often say to you, well, if there was any problem, the workers would be getting sick. Well, we know they are, but unfortunately for us, not fortunately for the workers, they are simply being paid off. They're being given financial gain and, and a confidentiality agreement. 
And so we can't get the data on the workers. But the fact that NIOSH put out that alert on silicosis for the workers gave us a good indication that there was more problems than... So the industry's claim that there are no health effects just doesn't stand up. Just doesn't stand up at all. And I would challenge the industry, if that is the case, then let's go to an area where we know we've got a lot of wells and let's do a proper health survey. Mm. Pay for one. Pay for a proper health survey. Send in not, you know, not sort of, if you've got a problem, fill in this form. And by the way, come and see a doctor who's a consultant for the coal industry. But, you know, a proper health survey. But I don't think they'll ever do that because they know that there are problems. Sure. I've just had um, one last question. Um, the, in, in, in America, um, you've heard all these stories about you know people being sort of given a sum of money for access to the land, and I'm just wondering if you know, because I mean obviously lock the gates have come together before any of that was allowed to, to go on because it's that sort of divide and conquer thing. Um, has there been many incidences where companies have come in and tried to pay people off and split the community, and I mean, obviously they've sort of they've, yes, I know what you mean. <laughs> come together, but um, it's a good, a good point to make because there's a difference between America and Australia and the UK. Australia and the UK, the government owned the resources under the ground. In America, you may own land, but you may own the resources under the ground, but you may not. But the difference is you can trade those. So you can buy and sell the mineral rights, where in Australia and the UK, you can't buy and sell the mineral rights. That belongs to government. So what happens when you say they come in and give money? In Australia, it's, it's on an average around 2,000 a well. So if they're going to put up a well, they will give you compensation of 2,000 or so a well. The problem is that's just for the well. It doesn't cover the, you know, the roads, the, the workers' mm -hmm. camp, which nobody ever thinks about because in our country, a lot of it's fly-in, fly-out worker. I don't know if it'll be the same. may not be here, but it certainly isn't your locals that get jobs because these are quite technical jobs. So, yes, there's a case where industry will try to provide mm. money and say, well, you know, I'll give you some money and if you take my well. But the thing is, we've now got enough farmers who actually accepted that in the early days before they knew, who are now begging us to work out ways to get out of these contracts. And there are no ways to get out of these contracts. Mm. Once they're signed, they're pretty much indefinite. Yeah. So, you know, there's enough experience for people to say, for a farmer to say to a farmer, don't go that way, you know, you will lose out big time. Mm. And, um, and that's pretty much happening all over the place. So there isn't the divide and conquer, you know, that you're getting in the States because basically, you know, they can pay big money for the mineral rights under your land, which is... Any more questions? <laughs> Sorry, just one more. Um, I, just, I just wondered um, whether you were familiar with sort of data on um, impacts on agricultural land, because you talked about sort of human health and sort of wider environmental impacts, and whether we see this, some of these chemicals or harms occurring because because they're affecting the food chain. Mm. Yeah, um, there seems to be stuff on that in the states. Yeah. Um, the harm to agricultural land in Australia has mostly been from two things, um, water drawdown, so lack of access to water, and salt. Um, because the produced water of coal bed methane is very heavily salted. Um, we have soils in some of our best agricultural growing areas where if you add salt, you literally make these soils impossible to farm. So. And the ter for us, the, one of the terrible things are, is that where the coal bed methane is, is some of our best agricultural and horticultural and vegetable growing land. So it's really our food bowl, and that's where, unfortunately, the coal gas is. So in that regards, just alienating that agricultural land um, is probably a big issue, but on, s on scope, it's probably the access to water in, in Queensland that's just affecting so many farmers. Just last one. I was interested in knowing what is the level of involvement and quality of involvement of the government in this project. The sense does the government put money in it? And because and do you have data on the fact that it's, it's actually convenient to do 
this tracking because there are conflicting studies that I've been reading about where some say that there's like a huge load of, of fracking gas and others say probably it's not worth it. So, uh, Thank you. Um, I can only talk from Australia on this one. The Australian government really support the industry because of the import-export balance and the trade figures. Nearly all of our gas goes overseas. It goes to China and India and now Japan after the nuclear accident. So for a government who loves good trade figures and balancing it, it suits them down to the ground. They love it. The industry also did the typical thing that it's done with other, or industry does with many things. It literally looked at some of the old uh, members of parliament, old le leaders of the National Party, and they are now part of the boards of directors of the company. So, you know, you start to build those sort of tight relationships with government. Um, government, again, in Australia, it's difficult because it really is state um, legislation that controls the practice. And so we have eight states, so we have eight different types of legislation. And no federal government is brave enough to say, let's nationalise any form of legislation. It would just be, you know, World War Three again. So, um, so it, you had a point at the beginning. I'm sorry, I lost. No, it. no. If they put up all the oh, money, I, yeah. I mean, do they finance? The In the New South Wales, they gave the industry um, a 12 month. It may have been longer, but we believe it at least 12 months. They will acknowledge. Um, free up the boil royalties. So for the first 12 months, the coal seam gas industry paid no royalties at all, um, which basically was a massive tax handout. Um, so yeah, that probably, we don't know about all the other states. It's, it has been a little bit like Paul said, it's been incredibly hard to get some of the data and some of the information. But how how the government, you know, who should, should understand the whole ramifications of it, yeah, exclude the first 12 months because that's the production of the world. Yes. Yeah. It seemed insane. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, we'll just leave us to say thanks to Marianne again Thank and uh, run the course. Yeah.